Episode 53 at Winning at Work with Travis Lemming. Travis really shows us the importance of delegation, really the art of delegation. It is definitely something he's quite good at, and he had to develop this technique. You see, when he graduated from College of Ozarks uh, with a Bachelor's of Science, Restaurant and Food Services Management, he knew he wanted to get into this line of work. And when he started at Andy's Frozen Custard, was a store manager, very, very successful. And then you go to a district manager, and now suddenly you've got to manage multiple stores, then regional manager, and expands even further, and then director of corporate operations. At some point, a very successful person realizes there's just not enough time in the day. I can't duplicate myself. I've got to start managing, developing, delegating, and building an organization of people that can replace me so I can continue to do more. This is a very natural development in the life of a leader. And Travis really walks us through this entire development for him. He's currently the chief operating officer at Fritz's Adventure in Springfield, Missouri. Huge goals. I really can't wait for y'all to listen to and meet Travis Lemming. Stay tuned. Well, joining me today on the podcast is Travis Lemming. He's the chief operating officer, lead company growth strategist for Fritz's Adventure. Travis, welcome in. Hey, thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me on today. You, you got it. It's been um, about a month or so since we since we last talked. I think the um, the world has changed three times over. That's right. It's all over the place, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to the changes that are currently happening right now. It's been great. Yeah, people are going back to work. Business travel is picking up. I'm getting lots of good signs about that. So that is, I guess that's one of the little silver linings to to all this, that people want to go back to work. And not only that, they want to go back to play. They want to go back and start enjoying the the outdoors, right? And which is That's right. a big part of what you guys do. Yeah, the, the outdoors, indoors. Um, but that, that's what we need. We need people back to work, working for us, working out there so that they want to enjoy uh, what they work so hard for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Well, before we get into our subject today of the art of delegation, which is absolutely an art, it is not a science, and everyone has different concepts and, and um philosophies around this. I'm really interested to, to hear your story because we talked a little bit offline and you accomplished some pretty amazing feats of delegation that allowed you and your company to grow. And I want to kind of tap into that and see if there's something there for the rest of us to learn that we can do it so we can start you know, accomplishing more at our work. Tell everyone just a little bit more about yourself personally. Where are you from? Uh, tell us a little bit about your current company and then we're going to kind of dive into this topic today. Sounds great. Thanks. Like, like everybody always says, we love talking about ourselves. So this, this will be easy on, on the podcast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona and Arkansas. Uh, parents uh, split up. So live with mom and dad every once in a while. Just moved back and forth. Uh, upbringing. Gotten to the uh, world of hospitality, the, the dark side is what I hear from professors in college. Did you pick college. it or did it pick you? I th- it picked me. I think it was small town, place was hiring, only place hiring. It's like, yeah, I can wash dishes. That sounds good for a first job. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> and, start there. <laughs> that's right. And, and then I was a bus boy uh, through high school, then started waiting tables. And then I think I picked it. I was like, wow, this, uh, this money thing works out really well. Um, yeah, high school was great. I, I enjoyed it um, and just went into college, just waiting tables. Uh, and enjoyed that a lot. I, and then it was like, wow, I want to be a history teacher. But in college, yeah, that history teacher, that's a lot of books to read. So, <laughs> that's a lot uh, more time yeah. in college. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so I was like, I really think uh, I, I like this waiting tables thing. I could be a manager. Uh, it's like I took some hospitality classes, and then I'm like, wow, I really like cooking. So went into culinary school, found out that was a little bit too expensive. And then uh, – Isn't it crazy in. how expensive it is? It is. It's, it's extremely expensive. It's a it's, lot more expensive than, than people understand. I mean, uh, um, I'm we've got one here in Atlanta. Well, we've got several here in Atlanta, but it seems like the real, like the, 
the specialty colleges, those are the ones that, that really stick it to you. That's right. And as much as I want to push people that way, it's just like, I, I gained a lot just by working in, in the back of the kitchen um, and right. just that apprenticeship type feel. But, you know, accreditation, oh, it is place important. For it. Now, you there went is. to um, College of Ozarks, right? Got your Bachelor's of Science. That's right. Restaurant That's right. and food services management. So, you know, you, you figured out early on you liked the industry. It kind of found you, but then you, you know, you kind of made the most of it, went to school and kind of picked up the uh, certificate, if you will. The, That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, College of the Ozarks was great. It uh, It's a work college, so... I, I, again, didn't what does have that a mean, lot of money. A work college? Uh, worked 15 hours a week. I worked in their, their restaurant, uh, and they paid for all four years of college for me. It was phenomenal. And I got the value of hard work from it, too. So it, it meant a lot. Wow. Yeah. And, and seeing how expensive colleges are today, if you can find that kind of a setup, I mean, that is golden. Well, you know, our paths crossed, little known to, but known to us, so I have a daughter who now she no longer works at Andy's, but she, when Andy's frozen custard moved to uh, open up a store in Alpharetta and Johns Creek, she was currently working at Chick-fil-A. And when that place opened up, we, we knew she was really not that happy working there after a number of years, different management folks that had come in. So we said, you know, why don't you go check out that Andy's place? And boy, she loved it. And I'm going to tell you, I think we all gained five, a happy five <laughs> pounds during that training because she kept bringing home frozen custards. That's right. My doctor was like, what are you doing? Uh, when I went to work for Andy's uh, three years in the uh, restaurant business, ran into a restaurant and then found Andy's and uh, joined them as a store manager. And um, yeah, and ate custard every day. What a wonderful company. Um, my wife worked for Chick-fil-A for a while and I, I compare the two of them a lot. I mean, the service aspect and you know, yes, just the quick service aspect. Just uh, good, wholesome, you know, good good values. You know, you could really yes, tell. Sir. And you really advanced through that company. As you say, store manager, district manager, regional manager, director of corporate operations. You had a good, good long run there. And then you got promoted to a big job, chief operating officer of Fritz's Adventure. Give us a, just a 30,000 foot view. What is Fritz's Adventure for those people who may not understand these types of, uh, are they called theme parks? What are they called? Uh, it's in between. Yeah, it's not really a theme it's park, right? There's yeah. no rides. Like. <laughs> That's right. It's pretty much taking everything you like to do, those zip lining activities, climbing, uh, just tunnels, all kinds of things, and then bringing it all indoors to do year round. So, it, it's just a huge complex. It's it's not quite a family entertainment center like you'd see at a Dave and Buster's or Arcade. Uh, it's just all those outside things inside. It's it's really right. kind more of hands on interactive right. type stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a phenomenal place, and uh, I love Andy's. Still love it and that company. Uh, eat it all the time. Had it for lunch today. Uh, but then uh, this was an opportunity to take all that knowledge and really help another company grow. So really wanted that next challenge. And it, it's definitely been a challenge, but it's, again, it, I'm still growing. So it, it's a lot of fun. Well, one of the themes on Winning at Work, the podcast, in, in our mission for those who those who aren't really kind of behind the mic, who, you know, the, the guests that come on, you know, we, we talk ahead of time and people understand really the mission here is really educate to elevate. We really want people to, to come to this podcast and pick up these nuggets of wisdom from people who are just frankly further along than you in your career. And that's how you learn is by listening to people who have gotten further along and they give you information. They help you. They're kind of like a, a digital mentor. You, uh, you, you need that to, to get ahead and, that was one of my first questions for you is, you know, you know, a relatively young guy, you know, you've made chief operating officer. Um, what do you think was the, um, the impetus for them? What, what, why did they help? You know, what did you do that helped you get to that COO level so soon? Sure. Uh, like you said, Tony, just listening to uh, your podcast uh, and, and everything like that from mentors, the ability early on to have somebody in my life say, get some mentors and then introduce me to somebody. Cause that's, that's a hard step in life to go out there, just try to find a mentor. Um, but once somebody, it is, 
once I had that, that wisdom, again, I always say we can go out there and read a lot of knowledge, right? Take in a lot of knowledge, but then you got to put it in play and you don't really know what's going to happen. I just really picked up on that whole mentorship and podcast uh, idea because the success was already there. At Andy's, we always said, you know, share our failures and successes. Great. Failures, let's fix together. Success, let's keep repeating. Well, I just took that in the same way in life and was like, well, they're successful. If it, Let's go. You know, I, I always say in all of all our studies we do at work on leadership and stuff, I'm not giving you anything new. I'm copying everybody else. But it's already, it's successful. Let's do it. You know? So that's that's how it's happened. I've just taken what everybody else has done so well and, and, and worked hard at it. I tell people I'm not the smartest guy in the room most of the time, but I can work really hard uh, and work harder than most people and just take that and work hard with it. And that's how I've been successful. Yeah. Listen, there's no shame in being a grinder and it is actually a sign of intelligence to hire very smart people to work around you. There is <laughs> that's no, right. <laughs> no shame in that. And you'll hear that theme quite a bit on this podcast and others and in, in leadership. It's definitely, uh, it's kind of a, I won't say a shortcut, but it's a, it's ensuring that you will be successful because you're surrounding yourself with, you know, with the right people. And as we talk about surrounding ourselves with the right people, that might be our segue into our topic today is, you know, what the art of delegation. And I think you were telling me some stories when you were back at, at Andy's and some of your, your failures and then your successes, um, that kind of prompted this conversation for us to have for a, a larger audience. Could you repeat, though, that expression that you used at at Andy's? You share your failures, you show, share your successes. What, what was that phrase again? Sure, that was one of their values uh, to, again, share your failures uh, and share successes. Again, we, we will work on our failures together and we will repeat our successes. Um, so work on our failures together. That's interesting. So it doesn't make it sound like you're singling one person out. No, because uh, for the entire company to be successful, we would take that information and have you know training built around it and just communicate that and say, hey, we've noticed this or this is a repeating pattern. Let's get together. And, I, and most people probably listen to this podcast or heard it somewhere else. You know, when we do things together, we all take ownership in it. It's not just a top-down type scenario, right, where it's like do this and you'll be successful. But once people say, hey, I think we should do it this way and we all agree on it, we got something rolled out a lot quicker than just that whole top-down scenario. What are they, what's the expression? Necessity is the father of invention. I mean, <laughs> when people start failing, you realize, hey, we need more training. Because if it's right. happening to this person, it's probably happening across the whole system. That's uh, right of restaurants, et cetera. Well, I think you kind of alluded to this and maybe, you know, you, you, maybe you're not giving yourself enough credit for it, but really it does sound like the art of delegation was really how you did kind of build and manage a large base of people in the organization, which enabled you to continue to rise up in your career. So tell us, tell us your philosophy, your strategy. I'm going to Stop talking. I want to hear your thoughts now on this, you know, art of delegation. Right. I didn't know this in the beginning, as, as we've talked about. I was doing that grinding thing. I've heard that on, a, on some of your podcasts and just trying to put everything on my back. But when I was given the opportunity to have a second location, especially when they were uh, two hours apart, I could no longer do the 60-hour work week at both locations. So that was that failure where it was like, wow, I don't know if I can do this. I got to figure something else out. And then finding out what type leverage and delegation means, it was like, oh, okay. And that's where my study and the focus became was, well, I understand the concept of delegation. How do you do this? First, it was exactly what you do, Tony, and, and you work with people like yourself to find the right people you can delegate to. I need to find those, those smart people out there um, and, 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 and kind of train them. Again, we find the right people. We train them. We've got to treat them right so they stay around. And then we got to put them in the right position to be successful. And that way you can start having that communication with them to, to, to take over. And instead of putting it all on my back, I can, you know, 
give that to others, make them feel valued, take ownership in something. And, and then we're able to just kind of start this cycle. Uh, as Maxwell says, that law of multiplication, leaders, growing leaders. So that way we can delegate more and get more done to become, again, the number one, like here at Fritz's, the number one guest experience attraction in the world or at Andy's with just such a, a huge amount of stores uh, to have you know, be the number one custard company in the world. Uh, and that all started with that idea that we've got to delegate because you can't do it all. I, I really, that speaks to me. I know it speaks to other people. We've all wanted to just duplicate ourselves. What was that movie? Yeah. Um, Duplicity or whatever it was. Where... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, I Making I, more I, of yourself. That's right. Um, and, and then taking a little bit of what everybody has and strengths and, um, and, uh, and learning and then focusing on it and, and letting people, letting people do what they do best. Um, again, I'd, I'd love to copy myself. That would be easier, uh, but it's not as rewarding. I think that would be a little, uh, <laughs> a little different after a while, but be a little not weird. as fun. Let's yeah. be honest. That'd be a little uh, weird. You know, right. we, we don't want our, our clones out there, but so yeah, that is a th that is a philosophy, though, right? The law yeah. of, mu of multiplication. So you you identify people. Now, do you go to people and say, "Well, I mean, so how do you choose the people?" I mean, sure. you're not forcing people into roles they don't want to be in. I don't. I wouldn't imagine, right? These are people who are wanting to kind of grow their career, so it tends to work out for you, right? Because you want to leverage and push down; they want to grow, so it should be a natural push and pull. It is. And I think in the hospitality business, and probably most would agree, that's, again, that's a different business to be in as far as the growth mindset. There's not a lot of people. Uh, I go to a career fair and I get about a hundred questions on, you know, can I be in marketing and, and sales um, and, and HR, um, public relations, but not too many that want to go into, hey, can I run uh, the operations for you? Can I can I dip custard all day long or can I harness people all day long? Uh, that's, that's different. So you do, you've got to find the right mix of for hiring from the outside, hiring from the inside. Uh, and, and the people you, you do have to have a desire. I, I, you know, in this business to, to be there and go, I, I find myself really enjoying this. If not, I'm just, it just doesn't work. That's a big theme too. If you're not passionate about your work, then you're not going to be successful. So yeah. How do you, how do you instill and find passion in young people? That might be a podcast in and of itself. Uh, that's <laughs> right. A, that's another whole topic of, you know, how to hire for, for that. So, okay. So you've kind of identified the people that you, you want to work with, that you're going to start this law of multiplication and the leaders growing leaders. So what do you do after that? Sure. I think it's just the idea that we can find people that um, kind of think beyond themselves. Um, and, and that's one of the themes that I kind of have in all of my interviews is that somebody that if we can have that law of multiplication, they're thinking beyond themselves and, and they're willing to go, hmm, I can make people better than me. I think some of the best trainers in the world think that way, that – I, I'm going to give this person that's working with me the best skills I can give them, but then I'm going to use my strengths as a leader to push them enough and find their, and find their strengths to push them to where they're doing things that I can't do uh, because I'm managing, but now they become the best in this position. Uh, and, and again, Tim Kirkland's books on how to, how to become the best server in the world. I mean, I think that's always an interesting fact, like, okay, well now you have, can that best server in the world feel extremely valued at, at that restaurant? Or can I have somebody that's just dipping custard all day, feel extremely valued? And then they go, wow, I love being here. This might be something I'm just so valued here um, that I might want to do this. And you have to, while you have expectations to keep, I think you've got to be a great salesperson of your business and the, the best example you can be within your business to show people like this could be a path for you. 
uh, you know, it's, it's the idea of like, Hey, why don't you come over and have dinner um, or ha- invite the team over, over to the house for a barbecue and go, the team comes over and goes, wow, you did this in operations. Yeah. I got a nice house. So I, you know, I don't drive a new car, but it's nice. It gets me around to a family's <laughs> taken care of. Um, and you know, a, a big backyard and, and we live really well. Um, and you can do that just by, you know, taking these things that I'm living out at work. Um, and that's what we try to find in people. And, and, and again, just young adults that go, yeah, I, I have a passion, I have a willingness, but I also have great character. Um, and we, and we all, we've all heard that it, it's, the, it's that idea. Do you care? And if you care, I can teach you all the skills. That's, that's nothing. But if you care enough, um, that's, that's that character that we're looking for. You said something about if they feel valued, they might see they have a career or an option there. There is something addictive about feeling valued. I've, I've worked in organizations where I didn't feel valued. I've done work in some um, nonprofits where I felt very valued. And it was amazing. I felt a strong attraction to do more volunteer work, and I wasn't getting paid. And yet here they were in some way, making me feel very valued. And so, wow, I don't know that, uh, that really resonated with me. Yeah. And I think it's, it's not always like we found, it's not always about pay. It's not, it's not always about, you know, it's just the little things. It's appreciation. Uh, I have worked with some great managers that were just so genuine in their thankfulness at the end of the evening after, after a shift. And you really just, I mean, I appreciated being thanked the way they thanked me at the end of the day. It was like, wow. Or just being a part of, uh, of being a part of their shift going, they really do care about me. Um, again, this just might be a summer job, but uh, it's going to be hard to work for anybody else because this person truly cares about me and values my time. Um, it's, it's for all of us that are making schedules, right? Like it's not about, it is about the business and scheduling for the business, but having the mindset that, we are scheduling somebody's life and let's, let's make sure that we understand how important that is and, uh, and and let them know. I mean, it's, we understand that we're scheduling your life. Let's have a conversation. What do you need? You know, how, how does this look for your life? And, and then we, you know, and then we talk about the business side too. expectations being met both ways. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're listening to them, but if anyone listening to this is having a turnover problem, your answer was just given to you. You make people feel more valued. And I know we're going to talk more about listening, but that is that you put those two things together and you're going to have people who are going to want to stick around. And therefore, these are people that you can mentor, uh, not mentor, excuse me. These are people that you can delegate to. That's right. Um, and and, that's and they key. want to take on the new responsibilities and... You know, the last thing you want to do is spend all your time training because essentially delegating, you know, you're training. That's right. Uh, Right. And you're just training them to do more and more and more of of your job. And if you're having to constantly start over because you have turnover problems, well, these are the little foundational pieces that you put in to keep the house from falling over. That is right. And and again, to be... To be more successful and to grow your business, you, you can't have that turnover because you've got to be able to, you know, delegate more and more and more. So you're able to do more. You go out and look for land or go out and to hire that next GM or, or whatever that might look like. Um, if you're still grinding away, um, dipping custard or harnessing people, you're not able out to do there. And, and again, in turn, that gives everybody else in your team more opportunities. And as you were talking about just that idea of listening, it's some of you are, you know, listening and, and again, myself are in that, that two directional funnel, right? You're right in the middle of, uh, and that can be stressful for a lot of people. And, and it's important with the delegation piece, um, and delegating is that we're listening to the top and the owners and the shareholders and, and everything, but then you, you've got your frontline workers. And a lot of us are stuck right there in the, in the middle. And a lot of people say, well, it was a two directional funnel. Well, it's everything's pouring at the same, to the same from spot from from both both ways. Yeah. From, from the, yeah, your staff. And then as you say, for me, I guess you're, 
you're reporting to the president and then you've got the board and the, and the investors, right? That's so. right. And, uh, you know, and I think listening is a big part of delegation because you're having to organize it all um, and, and make sure that the business is being taken care of, but the team that it's that's being delegated to is being listened to. So that way it can, everything can get done. I know you weren't necessarily going to tell us about any organizational materials or technologies, but do you have anything that helps you stay organized or that you use when you're delegating or training? Do you, or maybe it's proprietary, so you you know you can't say. But I'm just curious: do you, is there something in particular? Well, uh, I mean, no. Um, I I think mine's a hybrid. And I've, I've met with other leaders to kind of get a sense of what they use to stay organized. Uh, I have a very interesting technology slash just old school notepad system that kind of flows around in a big circle that allows me to keep everything organized. But as far as Fritz is and currently and, and even the, the systems that I used at, uh, at Andy's, I think there's a lot in, in regards to the communication systems that you're using. Um, for example, Microsoft Teams and allowing, I think people feel uh, ownership when they know what's going on. So those ideas, I think, I just go back to the old school newsletters. I, I think especially younger crew members that, that I work with in the majority of the, like most of my career, they enjoy that. They, they go, wow, I feel a part of the business when I know what's going on in the business. So Microsoft Teams allows us to do that. Um, uh, scheduling software, and there's lots of it out there, where weekly updates on, on what's going on and just them having a constant communication source with us. And it's all based on texting and, and things within or an app. So it's very comfortable to to our team and, and those individuals. And and that's how we stay, you know, checklists and tasks are all built into these apps or on your phone because that's where, again, most of my staff lives is on their phone and, and they feel like, oh, I'm connected uh, with my team. It's just not it's just not a job. I'm connected to this ecosystem at work. Um, and yeah, I don't think I can get that anywhere else. And that's what we're trying to provide. Yeah. Interesting. So you're kind of building that ecosystem around communication and values and tasks and training. And it all kind of blends together, but I guess at the end of it, you you're driving uh, retention rates too. I'm that's right. That. That's right. And productivity. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. Those that's retention probably rates. It's, secondary, yeah, or third. That's, that's right. Or first, I should say. <laughs> first, in, for a lot of us in business, especially if you're reporting to, to someone, you're like uh, having those better numbers at the end of the month and definitely at the end of the year. It's like, oh, okay, we're we're doing something right here. Right. That's that, that's definitely the, the proof in the pudding. Um, well, because you, you started the conversation off by saying, you know, when you took that – when you got that second store back at Andy's and it was two hours away, you realized – Hmm. Yeah. I can't put in 60 hours in both places. I'm not going to have a family. My wife's going to hate me. Uh, you're going to hate <laughs> yeah. yourself. Um, you mentioned something about time leverage. Yeah. So I just, we could all kind of think about 40 X and the, the four dis disciplines of execution. Um, what, what a great book. And, and when do we have the time to do all this? I'm, I'm in this whirlwind of, of tasks every day. And that's kind of where I went was like, I've got to spend time with others outside of my whirlwind and I have to delegate some of these tasks. And that was where, that was the very first start was just figuring out time leverage and, and having a, having a mentor tell me like, Whoa, I, I know. So when you're going to go cut brownies for the day, uh, <laughs> Hey, um, I know it's easier for you to go do it, but you're going to have to show somebody else how to do it and do it the way, you know, spend time with them, showing them the way that you want it done for your customers. You know, don't just go, go cut brownies, but it's that training piece we've been talking about so far. Just that, that idea of the perfect way that is going to make your six business successful. And that's just not something that a lot of us that are starting out our managing, you know, careers, uh, you know, look at things. We, we just want to go get it done, uh, because we're kind of that fixer or doer. And now we have to think of others 
And, and that's where we got to step outside of our whirlwind and, and go help someone else learn something. Now, I've not heard of this book, The Four Disciplines of Execution. It, it's phenomenal. It's a whole framework that is, it'll really guide you through on um, what the most important a- aspects of your business should be focusing on for a year. And it gives, I mean, it gives you really the whole setup. It, 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 again, for somebody like myself, I love just somebody stepping me through everything that can make me successful. And if I just follow it, it's going to lead me somewhere that's, that's worth going. And it's a great book to pick up and it will, it's, it'll just, it's not just a whole bunch of good information. It's a good information and a system uh, that really does work. You see, you're holding out on me too. <laughs> Everyone holds out on me. Uh, Everyone so- holds out on me. It's like, I come into this thing. I think I know what we're going to talk about. And then bam, here's your secret that you've been holding out on me. The four disciplines of execution. So can you tell us any more about that? Is I mean, I know I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> it really is just four steps to this system that it's like, what is your most important goal? What's this big, um, you know, idea that you have, whether it's a number or I think one of mine one's year, one year was, can we become the number one business on TripAdvisor, um, which is just another app out there like Yelp or Google reviews. And, and, and that was, that was how we executed everything we did from our weekly meetings, almost like a mission statement. Um, we had our mission and this, this execution was built around, again, hitting our mission all the time, but it was just that sub level. It's like, if we do this, we'll be, you know, that much closer to getting to our vision or mission. And, and really it's just that framework to get you there. A very That's good. I'll have simple, to go out and yeah. do a little more research on that one and um, put a link in the show notes so people can go back and find it. I love little hidden gems like that because there, everyone has has read a book or they've heard something in. I picked up another great idea from uh, Bill Reeder. He's the president over at Campus Cooks. He talked about the uh, EOS, which is the Entrepreneur's Operating System. And that was uh, just a, a real eye-opening framework that you use to basically run your business. And when you talked about this one, you know, I thought maybe there were some, you know, similarities there. So we'll have to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, I just wrote that down. So uh, I'll be interested. Yeah, EOS. To see yeah, that's that's awesome. That's, great. that's a really good one. Basically, the, the the system is designed to help the entrepreneur get out of the business, and it's it is specifically tied back into this art of delegation. But it's forcing. I use the word force. It's encouraging people to extend their timeline of thinking and managing projects further and further and further out with no supervision, essentially. So if you can get someone to work by themselves for three hours or three days or three months or three years, I mean, imagine when you can get everyone going in that kind of time frame, then you, the entrepreneur, or you as the COO, you're able to step out and do something completely different in the organization and help that organization grow. So it, these all tie together. That's fantastic. Cause that's what the four disciplines do too. In your weekly meetings with your team, everybody has their projects that all come back to that, that main, you know, goal and you let them go out. They just come in and report. It's that idea that, you know, Hey, I expect the best, uh, but we come back and we inspect for the best. So it's that we're all coming back to get to that goal. And see, that's the interesting part is who creates the goals or in the EOS system, they're called rocks. And I've heard that just, I've heard that terminology before. Everyone has two or three rocks that they're always working on. So do you design those or do they come up with them? Or is that passed down from the, from the top? How does that work in, in your organization? Uh, they come up with them. Uh, again, if you have ownership of something, you're, more enticed to, to do it. Oh, that's true. Um, and, that's true. And, yeah. And get it done. So again, their deadlines, um, and their, and, and again, this is people that you grow in your organization that you can delegate this way to. And that's probably why they're sitting in these meetings with you. Um, and it just, and we all know that it looks different for everybody. If, especially when you're starting out with a new leader that just, Oh, I, I enjoy this freedom. Um, I'm going to go, you know, for a run, which is great. 
at, but at the same time, we, we got to get work done too at some point in the week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, what's your philosophy around failure? Cause obviously when you're involved in delegation, you're pushing more work down to people and inevitably, right. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have some failures. Do you, I mean, how do you handle that uh, philosophy communication with the team? Yeah, that, that's, that's great. I, you know, I've worked for some people that, um, if you kind of micromanage things go well, but I just haven't seen that work well over the course of a lot of locations. So you have to be able to have a conversation about failure and ultimately I'll let people know up front uh, a little quote in our notes here. You might fail, but you are not a failure. Um, uh, when Joel Steen kind of plastered all over the, the internet with that, but, um, but they, they aren't. We, again, value them and go, hey, let's let's talk about that that failure and, and let's not repeat it. And, and then let's see if anybody else out there might be having the same struggle and, and let's tell them how we are succeeding after, after talking about it. But it's really just building up that confidence, um, especially for new new managers, new leaders um, to, to go. go. The, the best thing you can do is just take action. And, and I think that's what we're all so afraid of sometimes is I like, don't want to fail. So we just don't do anything. And at how fast paced the world is today, you're not going to succeed and you'll just be passed up if you're not taking action on something. That's music to my ears. Here we go again. I know this is my 10th time bringing it up on a podcast, but the Clifton Strengths Finder, I really think people should take this, see what it is they do well. And if, Anywhere in your top five or 10 is not activator. That means you're someone who doesn't like to take action right away. And there's probably a reason for that. Maybe you want to learn. You need to find something out. You need to discover. You need to, you know, practice a few times before you're ready to go. You need to figure out why you're not someone who wants to take action so you can just get in there and take action. I am the complete opposite of that. I take action when I probably should sit back. I mean, I yeah. am so action oriented that um, I get myself in <laughs> I get myself into trouble. And uh, again, I'd, I'd rather work with you, Tony. I, uh, you know, I, and I think a lot of us would. Um, so that that's a good that's a good thing. I, I hope so, it is. You know, yeah. I, I look at it as act, learn, adjust, act, learn, adjust. That's right. I, I live by that mantra, and. If people understand, they know your heart is good and you're only trying to do, do well, then hopefully, you know, there's room to make mistakes. And I wish I had been given that advice younger. So I really, I'm glad that you're instilling that with your teammates, uh, your younger managers and instilling that. And I hope people that are listening, they give that advice to those people too, because they need to know it's okay to fail. It's okay to act because you just can't. You can't learn. You don't know if you're, you're even good at it unless you try it. That's right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I love going out there and trying things, but I'm definitely not good at everything. Like I, I shouldn't even go play in the snow or ski or snowboard or I'm just. Is that not your thing? I mean, are you, yeah. are you like natural? So you're not naturally athletic. I would have. See, I think uh, most people think guys are just naturally athletic. Maybe yeah. you are. No, yeah. Just not in the form of uh, snow skiing or anything cold. I, I guess uh, <laughs> growing up in Phoenix, I uh, was like, yeah, I'm, snow. I'm not, I, yeah, I live uh, about as North as I could possibly live. Uh, <laughs> that's like the uh, Jamaican bobsled team. It just <laughs> that's doesn't right. quite make sense. <laughs> uh, no, no, I love the idea of just, at, just getting out there and trying it though that's that's important yeah exactly yeah just uh, make sure you put that safety harness on then you're good to go <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> got to keep the safety protocols um well what what other tips do you have or what uh, any other elements other pillars to your philosophy here for the, the for the art of delegation is there anything that we're missing i think we hear the word trust come up a lot. And I think sometimes you have, you know, I've had a couple of bosses look at me and they just are unsure what that means um, in business. And you hear it in interviews when you, or someone just say, yeah, I heard you just trust me to get this done. Um, and I think that leaders need to kind of put some time into that area of their life and, 
and what that means to them. Um, you know, everything's important. I mean, well, then is if everything's important, then is anything really that important? So, you know, when you, when you trust somebody, you just go, okay, I I've already told them that it's okay to fail. I, I just need to let them go. And, and again, I like, I'm going to definitely do this EOS, uh, this book, because I, I love the fact if somebody could just work on their own and they're trusted to work on their own and we're going to come back and yeah, we're going to follow up. I think great leaders follow up. That's key to creating culture, making sure that, well, uh, you know, if, if you want it done this way for your business, you got to follow up, but I trust them to take action. And, and I think that's a big thing. So everybody's just got to come to that definition in their life and, and have that conversation with their team and go, you know, here's how I look at this. And I trust you to do it this way. And, um, and then here, have fun, go, go do it. Yeah. Go do it. Trust, but verify. I know that's, that's right. Overused, but it's, it's just so simple. true. Now, yeah. what, you said follow up is the key to creating culture. I don't. What, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I've had this question before. I mean, seriously, I was like, I, wait a minute. It yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. How? So here, here's my philosophy. And, and again, there's See, so you've been many, holding out on me again. Yeah. You wait till the end, and here, <laughs> here we go. I just think the cult, culture is huge buzzword around you know business right now, and 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 my study of it and. And I believe in it very, very much so. Um, and, and I use this example. My team thinks it's funny. If, if I think Thursdays are purple shirt day, uh, to create the culture around my business that Thursday is purple shirt day, I believe culture is just a sum uh, of people taking action in a particular area. That's culture, just people that are – it's ingrained in us that Thursday is now purple shirt day. Um, so when I have a discussion with my team and said, hey, this is a culture issue – Let's see if we can shift the culture this way. I, I start by with me going, this is the example. So now I'm wearing a purple shirt on Thursday. But, you know, I have a lot of the team that thought it was kind of funny or, you know, I have one team member that was, you know, hey, I'll, I'll buy into this uh, and, and understand this. But then, I, you know, you have to follow up and explain the why and trust people to do it and delegate around it. And, and that's just constant follow up. So that way, you know, you, you create that culture a lot quicker than through that. What I believe people think a lot of times about culture is it just kind of happens on its own. And I, and I dis, I say, no, I can, I can create this a lot quicker by having those conversations, by following up with people on what we believe in and why we're doing it. And that culture now happens within a month instead of a year. And it's all about the I see. So your follow-up is really just your way of, it's a, really an excuse for you to go back and reinforce, reinforce, talk about culture and, and, Go over the why, why we do this, why we think it's important. That's right. Got it. That is a good, that is a good philosophy. I never really thought of it that way, but all right, you're right. We, I, lo I love leadership. I think we all do because it, that's the creative part in, in, in the business and, and even at Andy's and currently at Fritz's, I got to keep people safe at Fritz's. So I don't get a lot of creativity in what we do because it's, we have to harness this way. We have to get on a zip line this way. We have to put somebody on a wall this way, but I love leadership because that's when our leaders do get to be creative and, you know, everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses and in, in, in the idea of managing a leadership. So that, that's such cool. That's so cool. Well, these are kind of cool companies. I know we've got some competitors, I guess you'd call them of yours that are, you know, in Georgia, I, I sure. have seen them and I know they're, they're popular too up North, right. Or I guess yes. it's in a, real, a really hot climate, really cold climate, right. That's kind of where these things go. So, <laughs> That's right. What, uh, you know, when, when you can't go outside, you go here. Um, so you guys have big growth plans. Where can we, you know, I mean, where could we find you? What, what states or, you know, where are you coming next? Sure. I'll always rep Andes, but they're kind of all over the Midwest at this point. Uh, and, and you can go to eatandes.com to, to find all their locations and they're just expanding rapidly with us at Fritz's. We're so excited to, to be in Branson, Missouri and, and just a huge tourist destination for the Midwest and then growing, you know, our brand from there. And we're currently looking in a couple different big metropolitan areas. Um, and we hope to be in Dallas 
uh, in the next 18 months or so with our second location and then hoping to a nice expanse to, to continue to protect our culture and, and get a unit open a year is, is the big goal. Oh, that's great. Well, you're the perfect guy to do that because you've, you've gone through that and you've led the charge uh, that's in right. your previous company. So, all right, you've heard it here, folks. In um, 10 years, you're going to have 10, 10 states. <laughs> so uh, we're going we're gonna to have follow-up podcasts and we're going we're gonna to follow up. I like that. That'll hold me to it. It's going to hold me accountable. Get this you done. Know, listen, yeah. You say your goal, you make it, uh, you know, you make it audible, you write it down, you share it, you make it accountable. And now you're on the hook. That's right. And I love it. So I like that challenge. Oh, that's great. Well, this, it sounds like a, it sounds like a great challenge and it sounds like they're, uh, they're on the right path with you and your ideas of, of leadership and delegation and, just employee retention. You can't do any of these things if you can't keep your people, you know, engaged. That's right. Um, finding great people again, treat them right, train them right, place them in great spots to be successful and just keep growing. And we could probably have a whole separate podcast on just that, but thank you so much for being here today, Travis, and giving us your, your pearls of wisdom around the art of delegation. Tony, it was awesome to be here and thanks for what you do and your podcast. It's great. Yeah, you're welcome.